All right, welcome everyone to the HSC preliminary chemistry lecture um, for ATAR notes. So this will be part of our January lecture series. My name is Josh uh, and I'll be your presenter for the next about two hours, maybe just a little bit under. Um, so before we get started, I'm just gonna put out some pre sort of, just some pre comments about just ATAR notes and thanking ATAR notes. So ATAR notes has been around for a very, very long time. It's been, um, I think it was about 2007 when it first kicked off. Uh, 2007, 2008, and since then, we've essentially had free lectures running since about 2015, and there's plenty of other content that's been running since 2007. It started off with just forums, and it's really aimed at helping students succeed in in getting you know the help they need in the online setting. Essentially, we started off, and we've moved into a bit of tutoring and a bit of um, in-person content, but we have also really been aiming at that sort of online sort of forum. Um, I graduated way back in 2018. I've been around for a fair while. And even back then, I was attending these lectures um, online and in person. And I was utilizing the, the resources they had. I had the ATAR notes, topic tests, etc. So it's been around for a very long time. Um, so here's just a sort of a list of some of the free resources we have. Please check it out, um, especially over this sort of lecture series. You can see that there are lectures explaining what's going on. What is ATAR notes doing? What can I, where can I get the help? Where can I sort of move from here. And that's the sort of stuff that you should really be checking out when you can. Um, so as you can see, we have things such as like study notes, uh, lectures, as you're at, at today, hopefully at the pre at the premiere. If you're not at the premiere, that's okay. Um, you'll also find there are discussions, um, online discussions, and there are some videos and forums and so forth. But we've also moved into sort of the realm of um, some more sort of paid, some more sort of paid, paid processes and um, paid resources and essentially we have programs such as our Tute Smart program I'm sure you've heard of if you haven't check it out it'll be in one of the tabs above this video and you'll also find that there'll be a lecture on it uh, this week uh, check it out uh, Tute Smart is essentially who I work for um, I'll explain a little bit but I'm essentially down in Victoria now <clears throat> and so I work with um, VCE students mainly um, but HSC VC is very, very interchangeable. The two topics are pretty much identical, especially at the one at the, I call it one, two level now, but the preliminary level, very, very similar. Um, but what you'll find is that uh, the sort of ATAR notes plus is our now paid online program where essentially it's like a monthly subscription and you get access to all of those, those topic tests and those course notes, those big books that everyone takes around. You don't need to take around those books anymore. You can essentially just pay a monthly subscription over 12 months, let's just say you bought four of those books over 12 months, you, you're going to spend less money than buying four of those books. So if you bought four of them, let's just say you bought the course notes for four of your five subjects or, you know, however many you're doing, um, you're essentially getting the course notes and the topic tests for all of your subjects for less over 12 months and you don't need to carry them around with you. Um, we also get access to what we have is a new AI answer bot. So essentially moving into the realm of AI, it's sort of like an AI tutor. It's definitely not as good as a real tutor. Um, and it's something that will never, I don't think it will ever really overtake, uh, but it is very, very good. It's learned from all of the sort of ATAR notes books. So you have to teach an AI. And so that's what we've done. We've taught it with all the ATAR notes books. And so it will answer your questions as best as possible. It's actually pretty useful. There's a couple of things that I learned from it when I was playing around with it. I was like, all right, I haven't really gone over this in a while. Teach me about this. And it, it taught me about it. And it was really, really good. Um, there's also flashcards. There are exams on there from um, companies such as NEEP. We uh, have taken over NEEP in the last couple of years and they run by uh, ATAR notes lecturers now and shoot smart tutors and et cetera, stuff like that. Um, oh, suddenly lost HDMI. Hold up. I think I'm back. Amazing. No, nope, no, I'm not. No, I am back. No, nope, I'm not. No, nope, I am back. My slides are a little bit wacko. They'll come back. Don't worry. Sorry, I have just moved into a new joint. So my, uh, this is actually the first time I plugged my HDMI back in. Hopefully that's still all recording. That is still all recording. Amazing. So essentially there was a girl called Isabel who's meant to be running this lecture. Um, and Isabel is a great chemistry tutor. Um, I've met her before. She's awesome. Runs heaps of the HSC chemistry lectures. She's sort of like the, the head of HSC chemistry. I'm sort of the head of VCE chemistry. However, um, Isabel is away, I believe, in the Philippines at the moment, island hopping and having a lot of fun. And the recording for this lecture had some issues, so therefore they sort of reached out and got me to run it. 
Um, I've been through this content before. I've actually taught a HSC class before in the past, so I know this stuff pretty well, and it's pretty much identical to the VCE stuff. Um, it, I would argue it is practically identical. I've done all of this before. Um, so essentially, um, my name is Josh. A little bit about who I am, because I don't have a who I am slide on this at the moment. Um, I am down in Melbourne. I currently study medicine at Monash Uni. Um, I'm in my final year, so it's technically my my fifth year, but it's actually my sixth year of uni. I did an honours year in the middle there. I did an honours year last year after my fourth year um, at the Victorian Heart Hospital, um, sort of into sort of um, preventative medicine in the cardiac space. So I did an honours year that year, last year, um, and essentially this year I'm in my final year of placement. So I'll graduate at the end of this year. Outside of that, I've been tutoring since 2019 um, at Smart by ATAR Notes, and I've been running these lectures since the end of 2019. So uh, I'm pretty sort of pretty well knowledge, got a bit of wisdom as, as, as you could say in the sort of chemistry side of things. Um, but just some points Isabel wanted me to point out was that essentially um, preliminary chemistry, very similar to unit you know, one, two chemistry is very much like the sneak peek into chemistry. It's sort of like the ground blocks. I like to describe it as like the, the foundation to your house. You're gonna, when you build a house, you're gonna put a, either, you know, you're stumping it or you're putting it into, co putting a concrete slab down and then putting down your frame. And your framework, this is essentially your slab and your framework. Then you're gonna build on from it. You're gonna then do all your architectural fun and that's your year 12 content. She eventually, she essentially said in this slide that she sort of found year 11 a lot more of a breeze than year 12. That year 12 is where, you know, you get into the fancy things and it gets a little bit tougher. It's the same at VCE level and it's, it's gonna be the same anywhere. When you do the preliminary side of things, you're really building that that base. So a lot of stuff will seem at times quite straightforward. There will be things that you'll find really difficult and that is fine, but you'll find some things a little bit more straightforward and you'll be like, hmm, why is this so straightforward? And then you understand why when you get to year 12 and it's an expectation that you know that content. That's a really big, that's a really big thing at sort of unit, or I should be saying preliminary chemistry. Understanding that the content you're learning this year is expected knowledge in year 12. So as much as you might, you know, you might have a sack where you don't do as well and you're like, mm, I didn't do as well on that, I'm a little bit disappointed. Do not stress. It's sort of, you're sort of at that point in time where you need to say, hey, this is the content I need to do. This is the content I need to be good at. So therefore I need to, you know, really push and nut down on it and really be able to, you know, be able to push this out next year without having to worry about, you know, adding on all that extra stuff. Um, also just on top of it, What's going to happen today? We're going to do an overview of chemistry. We're going to break down module one. So this is module one is there's four modules in uh, preliminary chemistry. I'll go through all four of them in a second. But essentially, we're going to break down module one. We're going to go through it. We're also going to talk about how to study chemistry um, and sort of depth studies. Um, and essentially, it says here, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you've got the live chat there for those of you who are at the um, the premiere. Please don't be afraid to ask questions. I'm assuming Isabel will be there for the premiere. If she's not, it'll be me. Um, but please don't be scared to ask any questions. Uh, as you know, you feel free to, uh, if you don't watch this at the live premiere, cause maybe you have something on, you watch it a little bit later on, please don't also be scared to sort of look through that chat. Um, you won't be able to ask me questions in it. It won't be, um, available at that point, but the, the sort of the transcript of the chat will still be available. So you'd be able to go into the chat and go, all right, what was spoken about here? What was spoken about there? Cool. Feeling better. Um, so just really important. Also, if you notice me, spinning to my right, going like this to my right. It's because uh, I have my lecture up on a monitor, which is why it would have just gone black before because my HDMI cord would have been just having a little bit of a day. Um, but essentially what we like to think about is that chemistry is the study of the tiny little building blocks of life. Um, and then we move forward with it. But just some commonly asked answered question, what's the difference between prelim and HSC chemistry? Well, preliminary chemistry is your, sort of your, your ground base. And then HSC is, you know, um, what well, counts towards your ATAR. Um, and then is HSC chemistry more important than preliminary chemistry? Well, yes, it is because your HSC chemistry is essentially where you get your marks from. If you know you want to go into science, you want to go into medicine, you want to go into nursing, whatever you want to go into, that's essentially going to be a science sort of rounded subject because you, I'm assuming you're doing chemistry, you like science. Um, that's where you get your marks from. That's where you get your ATAR from. All right. So um, we just discussed sort of the idea that sort of HSC chemistry is more important because it counts towards your ATAR than preliminary chemistry. And as you can see here, these are the topics you're gonna to go through. So you're gonna cover properties and structure of matter, um, uh, introduction of quantitative chemistry, reactive chemistry, and drivers of reaction. So that's what you're gonna cover as part of preliminary chemistry. 
HSC chemistry, you're going to cover sort of the equilibrium and acid sort of reactions. You're going to cover acid base reactions, organic chemistry, which is universal. It's in every single chemistry study you do. So you'll cover it a lot. And then you're also going to have to study applying chemical ideas um, as that also comes up a lot as well. Um, applying chemical ideas, by the way, is very much a, very much like a application of everything you've done. So you'll find that's what you sort of go through. Now, just as another point, depth studies. So these are essentially just a scientific investigation. Depth studies is just a fancy word for it. Think of it like a scientific investigation. It's part of your syllabus, your study design. Essentially what this is, is you're going to complete one depth study this year and one depth study in HSC chemistry next year. What's really, really important is that I want you to use this as a practice year. Now, don't use it literally as a practice in terms of I don't really care what I get, I don't care what I do. You still want to care about it, you still want to do well, but use this as a really good sort of jumping point to say, all right, I learned this there, I learned that I did that well, I learned that I didn't do that well, how am I going to apply myself differently and so forth in the next year. Now, from this as well, um, the depth studies are essentially like a working scientifically. You're going to plan out an investigation, you do some research, you're going to uh, carry out that experiment, you're going to apply the results to the research that you've done, so you do a bit of actual scientific research. Um, and really the big point here is don't worry if you have no idea what's going on, because you will learn about all the words we're going to discuss in a minute. And you are going to learn how to do one in your class, but we just wanted to give a very sort of brief overview of what these look like. So you're going to produce either a poster or a scientific report. Usually a scientific report is a more formal way. Sometimes schools like to do posters, it's a bit different. Scientific reports essentially are built like this. You start with the title. The title is usually like a question, something like that, like a question or um, a statement, but usually questions are better. You're then going to go through an aim and a hypothesis on so an aim of what you want to do, a hypothesis of what you think is going to happen. You'll discuss your variables, which we'll discuss on the next slide. Then you'll go through your materials. You'll go through sort of your, um, your risk assessment. You'll go through your methodology. You'll go through your results. You'll go through your discussion and your conclusion. Now, what's really important is one thing I just wanted to point out is that um, a lot of students will find that as they go through, they find that that they spend most of their time in the discussion. That is normal. I want you to spend most of your time in your discussion. I don't want you to be be putting more than you know forty percent into the rest of it. It should be sixty percent discussion at a minimum, and then from there everything else sort of takes a back step. The other thing as well is results. Um, results as well, you'll find it's your raw data. You may have to do some calculations to it. If you have to do some calculations to your raw data, please don't be scared to and then submit it. Um, that's pretty normal. The other thing as well with your results is uh, table format is the last format you want to put it in. If you can put it in a graph, put it in a graph. Even if there's no, you know, number values there and you're like, oh, but I want to quote some number values in my discussion. Quote them still. doesn't matter if you can't see them exactly on your graph. Your graph, you should be able to, like, look at your graph and go, all right, I'm moving on the line. All right, it would have been there. Cool. That doesn't matter if they have to do that. You do not want to put a table there with just numbers. Tables look terrible and it's the last resort. Please don't do that if you get a choice. Um, that's part of, sort of one of the things that's really important. Um, so try not to use a table if you cannot. If you have to, that's okay, use a table, but try, try, try not to. And I say it's okay because sometimes you will get data or you will do an experiment where it's sort of the only way you can display it is through a table and that's okay. That happens. So if that happens, just display it as a table, it's fine. Um, your discussion will be the main part of it. As I said, we'll discuss a little bit more about the discussion on the next slide, but essentially it's going to be the guts of what you go through. It's going to be most of it. You're going to spend most of the time on it. You're going to use all your research on it. That's what you're going to do. Your conclusion, essentially a couple of sentences saying, hey, did I get the aim? Did I get the hypothesis, etc." cetera. Um, so if I look at the sort of discussion and the variables, just two main points of variables. Really important, you need to know these three types of variables, and independent variable, dependent, and control. So independent variables, what you manipulate. As the scientist, you're gonna manipulate this. So I'm gonna have one beaker of water and one beaker of water with salt in it. So I put salt in one beaker, I didn't in the other. That's what I did, independent variable. Dependent variable, how long does it take to freeze? Well, I can't determine, I can't say, all right, I want this one to freeze in five minutes, this one to freeze in 10 minutes. I can't do that, I've gotta test that. So that's what I'm going to measure. And I'm going to measure the differences between the two beakers. So that's essentially my dependent variable. Now, there's a couple of things that is really important. 
controlled variables, you need to name at least three of these on your report. But if you do more than, let's just say you do more than three, doesn't matter. You can name more than three, but you only really have to name three on your report. Um, if you've got no word limit, I'd name all of them, but usually you have like a thousand to 2000 word limit on these assignments. So three is fine because otherwise you run out of room and you're wasting words. Uh, but essentially you need to control some variables that could change what's going on. If I had salt in one and norm and no salt in the other, but one of them was really small, one of them was really big, well, the, the freezing points are going to be different. So it's a waste of time. So the amount of water to be freezed um, is one of the things you want to keep the same. The freezer temperature, you don't want one freezer to be colder than the other. Doesn't make any sense. So things that you need to keep the same. Discussion. Um, typically the most difficult session, section, as I said, um, it's where you talk about what's going on in the experiment. And I think the one line you need to know here is analyze your results. It's where you analyze your results. You say, hey, my results, they trended this way because my results did this because. Uh, do they support my hypothesis? Yes, no, because. You're always going to be thinking of because. I don't want you to be using that word every sentence, but you're going to be thinking about that word. Because this, because that, because this, because that. So that's what you're going to be thinking about as you go through. So always think because of this, because of that, etc. Um, you're also going to talk about concepts of validity, reliability, and accuracy. Don't worry about those terms. You will learn them as you go through and you will apply them. You're also going to dissect your method. Now, we don't mean literally, you know, cut open and look at the organs, but we kind, of, we kind of do. You're going to be looking at your method and going, hey, this worked really well. Hey, this didn't work well. Why did this work well? Why did this not work well? Is there a reason this didn't work well? Is there a reason that worked well? Is et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the things that you will be going through as you, as you go through it. Um, also really important, we will refer to um, how you can improve your experiment. So if you're going to perform it again, what would I do differently? As well as that, you're going to sort of discuss sort of um, what you would potentially do in future to build upon it. So what if I did this experiment again? Would I actually do something different in terms of would I do another experiment or would I do the experiment again? If I did another experiment, what would I do to build upon the results that I already got? Something like that. You're always going to say that you do the experiment again because you want to do the experiment multiple times to check that your results are accurate. Properties of matter. So let's jump into our first sort of module, um, if you'd like to talk about it like that, um, and essentially what we're actually going to be going through. So properties of matter, I want you to explore the, the homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures through practical investigation. So what do these two words mean? Because they're two very distinct terms that you may not actually understand what they mean. So homogeneous means a mixture that is uniform in composition throughout. So what that essentially means is that the mixture is everything that is the same. So it might be water with salt and everything is salt. Heterogeneous is a mixture which has variations to its composition throughout. So what that means is that you may have different things in that mixture. Um, and I like to think of it like this. So you've got matter and you've got matter that sort of breaks down into this little flow chart. You've got anything that occupies space, has a mass, is composed of atoms, etc. And then you've got pure substances and then you've got mixtures. Now, mixtures are two or more pure substances bonded together. Homogenous are uniform in composition throughout. So they're going to be, as I've said, everything's going to be the same. So even if there's a pattern to it, it's all going to be the same. If it's not a pattern, then it's going to be heterogeneous. Now, that might mean that the two mixtures you've put together don't like each other. Now, you're going to learn a, about a thing called polarity. Polarity is whether something has a slight charge or not. Now, if something has a slight charge, it is polar. Water is polar. If it doesn't, it's going to be called non-polar. Now, something that is non-polar is oil, fats. Now, if you think about a cup of water and you pour some oil in, what happens? It makes those weird blobby bits that don't mix in. You can never mix the oil in. No matter how much you mix it, it will never mix in. You get these little fat, round, oil bits that just sort of clump in. Eventually the oil moves to the bottom because the oil is heavier than water. Now, what's really important about that is that is a heterogeneous mixture because you've got one thing in one spot and you've got another thing in another spot. Um, it's not sort of uniform. They're not mixing together. It's not very good. Now, you also have pure substances. So this is one type of atom or molecule with distinct measurable properties. So compounds, these have two or more elements bonded together. Elements are essentially one type of atom. So if I said I have a, um, let's just say I had oxygen gas, that's an element because it's just 
as much as it's a compound, there's two um, oxygens together. We call an element because it's just oxygen. That's probably a terrible example. Let's just say I have aluminium metal. I have pure aluminium metal. Pure aluminium metal, it's one type of atom. It's only aluminium, therefore it's going to be a really hard metal. Compounds, on the other hand, if I did like a, an aluminium alloy, so if I did the aluminium alloy, it would, you know, it had, it's aluminium mixed with something else. And essentially that's a compound. As you can see here, this is one of those things, heterogeneous mixture. So if you sort of went, it's particles distributed non-uniformly. So as you can see here, there's no uniform mixture. Particles that, homogeneous are particles that uh, have a, you know, a pattern. Their uh, distribution is uniform. So things like rain, steel, other things there. So that's a really good way of thinking about it. Now, we also like to talk about with these is our physical and our chemical properties. So what are our physical properties of, of atoms and molecules? What are our chemical properties? So they're two very distinct things and it's really important you understand the differences between them. So physical properties are essentially properties that can be observed and measured without changing the substance. Chemical properties on the other hand are essentially properties described on how readily a substance undergoes a chemical change. So with those things in mind, I like to think of things like acids and bases. So we understand that acids and bases don't like to join together. They go, no, we don't like each other. And so therefore they like to, you know, they like to react with each other. That's a chemical property that acids don't like bases and bases don't like acids. However, a physical property such as the color of an acid is you don't have to measure sort of the change. You can just keep the substance there and look at the color to test how strong an acid is, you need to sort of react it with a base. That's a really important thing. That's a chemical change. You need to go through some sort of chemical change to measure it. Um, flammability. So if I wanted to see if an acid is flammable, I'd have to set it alight. I have to put some fire on it. I'm applying a chemical change. And that's really important. Um, so quick question, is boiling point of a substance a physical? or a chemical property? What do we think? What is it? It's physical or chemical? It's a bit of both. It's actually a really, really important thing. So boiling points are kind of both physical and chemical. It's a really terrible circle. It should have been somewhere like in more in the middle. It's, it's a bit of both because essentially we have got to change it a little bit and it has got to do with the chemical properties of it. So it's got to do with the bonds that are, that are between molecules and we will discuss that further. It's actually at the end of this lecture, I think, we discuss bonds. Um, I remember going through this and I was like, hey, there's bonds. Bonds are one of the most common things you need to learn. It's one of the things that you'll find the most useful out of today. So bonds determine boiling point. But at the same time, it kind of is a physical property because it physically changes what's going on and it's something that you can sort of just observe. A little bit of an obscure one, but don't worry too much about it if it's not making too much sense. Now, what we like to do with understanding that we have physical and chemical properties is we like to then discuss, all right, what are our separation techniques? What are we actually going to do to, you know, look at different molecules, different mixtures, different everything that's going on. Now, there are two main methods of physical separation, filt filtration and evaporation. Chromatography is not as common, um, but it is one of the methods you can utilize. So don't worry, we won't probably discuss that as much today. We will discuss filtration and evaporation. Um, these two are, reply, are classified as physical methods as they rely on differences in physical properties of the components um, of the mixture. So what we want is we use filtration and evaporation to essentially, if we've got a mixture of all these different molecules and we want to separate them out, we use their physical properties to separate them. We go, all right, you have a lower boiling point, you have a higher, higher boiling point. You um, have a different color. You have this color. You have something else you know there's plenty of different physical properties you could use Essentially, so we look at those physical properties and we go all right you have this you have that how can we break them apart so um essentially as you can say these are classified as physical properties as they rely on differences in the mixture so filtration and evaporation how do they work filtration is about particle size and solubility now solubility is the ability for something to um, absorb into water um, and it is a physical property so a description, when a mixture is passed through a filter, the insoluble solid is blocked by its physical barrier. 
uh, whilst liquid passes through the filter. So essentially what happens is you'll find that you get a filter, it's like a coffee filter in a sense, and you pour your sort of your mixture through it and you want to separate it out. And essentially what you do is you separate your two, um, your solids from your non-solids and essentially the liquid passes through and it's filtered. Now evaporation is really interesting on this sort of two main ones. Distillation is probably more common than crystallization, but we'll discuss it very quickly. Crystallization is when you have solids and a liquid. And essentially when the mixture is heated up, the liquid evaporates to form a solid solute. So essentially what happens is um, the liquid evaporates and as the liquid moves away, you're left with just solids. You're left with just the crystals that were in the liquid and that's all you want. So that's what you're been looking for there. Distillation on the other hand is where you have two different liquids and what you do is you essentially just boil these two liquids. So you get these two liquids and you boil them. So they're, they're mixed in together. It's a mixture. So you're essentially boiling one mixture. So you boil off that mixture and essentially what happens is the liquid with the lower boiling point will evaporate first. It will become, you know, a gas first. And as it becomes a gas, it moves up into a tube. This is what it'll look like. It's like a tube. I'll, I hope there's a photo of it. I think there's a photo of it coming up. Um, there is, but essentially it evaporates. I'm going to get that photo off. It's a much better way of explaining it. Essentially what happens is you get this liquid and it boils and the first thing, the first component, the, the one with the lower boiling point will boil first. Essentially as it does is it boils up and it hits this and it gets pushed down into this tube. Essentially this tube is, essentially, is called a condenser and what happens is water runs around this tube. So this tube has like a double layer. It's like one layer and another layer. In this outer layer, there is no gas there. The gas from this mixture is in the middle layer. The outer layer is like a pump and it pumps cold water through it. And that cold water is running around that inner layer and that inner layer is really cold. So essentially when the gas goes in here, it gets in this really, really cold environment and immediately it becomes a liquid again. And you've made this tube in such a way, it's not gonna be able to escape back in there, it's gonna go down in here. And essentially, you get this distillation. You get this liquid coming out, which is different to the mixture. It's essentially one component of the mixture. So you keep boiling this or all at whatever temperature it is that the first thing boils and you keep it at that temperature and you boil off all of the mixture that was in there of the one part that was at that boiling point and it should come out as a distilled component and eventually you'll be left with the perfect amount of what you had of the other component. So that's what that looks like there. Distillation is easily the most common. Distillation occurs with sort of crude oil, which is our raw version of our petrol, um, something that you'll see a lot. It also happens with things like gins. So if you've heard of a gin and it's an alcoholic spirit, um, you distill gins a lot. Um, it's got to do with sort of ethanol components and so forth. You also do it with other spirits, um, but you'll see that that's sort of how that works. Um, now there's also some other separation techniques that are slightly different. Uh, there's decanting and centrifuging. Now, centrifuging is used in medical terms a lot. So, me being in sort of medical research, we use the centrifuge to separate blood samples. Um, it's the most common use of it. Decanting, on the other hand, is a little bit different. You essentially use gravity to separate substances. So, you use the principle that a lighter substance will float to the top while a heavier substance sinks. And you sort of leave things over a period of time and you look at the density. So you sort of, um, it's interesting because you sort of leave a mixture, you sort of make a mixture, you get a mixture and you leave it over a period of time in a certain position. And over a certain period of time, you should, they, they should separate and you sort of pour out that first part. And so that's how you separate it. Not as accurate as centrifuging. Centr centrifuging is doing that in a much quicker terms. Essentially what you do is you spin the sample. So you put a sample in and you spin it. And you spin it really, really quickly. Um, and I think there's a photo of it um, as I was going through. Yes, this is centrifuging. You put a sample in and essentially it spins really, really, really quickly. And essentially what happens is the heavier sort of substances end up at the bottom of the tube. They end up further away. And the lighter substances end up more at the top of the tube. And when that stops spinning, you're left with all the, the heavy content at the bottom and all the light content at the top. And essentially you can, from there, you can essentially go through and pull out everything else that you have there. Now, just quickly, here's some photos of all the techniques. So you had, this would be 
uh, your filtration. As you can see here, you've got filter paper, you, put, you get your residue out, you get your liquid at the bottom. This would be uh, part of your evaporation or your distillation sort of technique. So here's your evaporation. You hope that you sort of end up with a, a solid at the bottom if you're gonna use crystallization. Here's your distillation. Um, and then this is sort of your center of fusing. Um, we didn't really go through, there's no point of decanting because decanting there's nothing to do. You essentially just leave it over a period of time. Pretty boring technique, nothing to do. So from here, what's really important to understand is that um, the percentage composition is something that you would then measure from this. So you've been given essentially the mass of a mixture and you want to figure out what percentage is one element or one, you know, compound within that mixture. So this is really interchangeable. So as much as this is, this is written in a way that it says percentage by mass, you can also do this in terms of percentage by mixture. It's the exact same technique. So if I, let's just say, interchange this word of massive compound for massive mixture. So if I had a mixture and I said the mixture was 30 grams, and then I, you know, I went through either centrifuging or I went through distillation or some other technique. And I'm left with, I pulled out 10 grams of what I wanted, or maybe we'll say 15 grams of what I wanted. And one of the components was 15 grams. I would then put 15 over 30 times by 100, I'd end up with 50%. So I'd say that 50% of my mixture was whatever it was that I wanted. Maybe it was like a salt or something that I got out. However, you can also do this by compound. So if you have a compound and you want to figure out what elements are in there and you use one of the techniques, you use actually, you'd have to use a different technique because you have to look at chemicals, but nonetheless, you find that there is five grams of this element in there when I had 40 grams of the compound. Essentially, you then go five divided by 40 times by 100 and you get your answer you want. So it's really important to understand that that as much as that would be what, 5%, um, your, your terms on this calculation or this formula can be interchangeable. So percentage composition is a really, really useful, um, really useful sort of uh, formulae. Also important um, that a common, mistake is a common mistake is having different units for the denominator. Please don't have different units as a denominator. That wouldn't work very well. Um, it allows us to numerically express how much of a substance um, is present in a mixture or a compound, essentially what you want to look at. Um, so as you can see here, this is an example, given that there is 50 grams of copper in a 2.5 kilogram sample of metallic mixture, what is the percentage mass of copper? So this is what we we're trying to say just in that last slide. You need to be really, really careful with these questions. You need to be sort of switched on to what is going on. You've been given 50 grams as grams. You've been given 2.5 kilograms. So therefore you need to be able to interchange those two. You need to say, all right, what is kilograms? What is grams? And sort of mix the, and get the right one. So you could have done this in kilograms. If you wanted to, you could have said, all right, that is 0 0.05 kilograms. Go for your life. You could have said that. You can also say 50 grams divided by 2,500 grams, which is a much easier way of doing it. I'd prefer that way over the other way. Um, but beyond that, uh, you do your calculation times by 100, 0 0.02 divided by 100, 2%. That's how you go about those questions. So fairly straightforward type questions. Um, I would hope that there's not too much issue with these, um, but that's sort of how you're going to go about it. All right. So periodicity, or I like to just think of it as the periodic table. I think there's too fancy of a word. So you're probably wondering why we've just jumped around. Um, 1.1 also talks about how the position of the periodic table can tell us about the chemical physical properties. So why have we jumped all the way to 1.3? Well, really important that 1.3 sort of talks about the periodic table and I feel like when we were sort of, I was looking at these slides and I was discussing it, we kind of need to go through this first. So we kind of need to go through what is the periodic table and what is going on with the periodic table prior to sort of the mentioning of periodic table as part of our sort of unit of module 1.1. It's sort of badly planned out. So that's why we've sort of pulled this forward. So as you can see here, this is what a typical label in the periodic table is. So I'm hoping you've seen a periodic table before. I'll grab up, this is the VCE chemistry 
uh, data booklet. So you get given this in exams. You get a similar thing in the HSC exams, but a little bit different. This is the periodic table they give you in that. So notice how these labels, so let me find carbon, carbon over here. This is the carbon label, very similar to this, although a little bit less in detail. Your one that you get will also be like the one that I um, have got up here. Um, but as you can see here, it's carbon 12. It says six carbon, it says six and then C and then 12 and then carbon. So essentially the C refers to carbon. Um, the 12 is the uh, relative, relative atomic mass, which we'll discuss. And the six is the atomic number. And there's some of the things that you're going to need to know when going through this. So this is a periodic table. This is a really big and massive periodic table. Now, Isabel went through and highlighted the molecule that you will need to know or the atoms that you will need to know, the elements that you will need to know. These are the ones you need to know. You have hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, nitrogen, uh, sorry, sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium. You've got iron, you've got copper, silver, gold, zinc. You've got beryllium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, helium, alum, uh, aluminium, silicon, Phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. So you will learn all that. And as you can see, it takes sometimes it takes me a little bit more to process. It, it does happen. I've been going through chemistry since 2016 when I started doing unit one, two chemistry or year 10 chemistry. And then 2017, I did unit one, two, which is preliminary chemistry. 2018, I did three, four chemistry. I've been doing chemistry since 2016. It's nearly a decade at this point, which is a very long time. It's still, at times, I have to sit back and go, all right, what is that? What is that again? What is that? Uh, it's that. And it, it does take time. It takes it takes looking at this loads and loads to know what's going on. Now, I couldn't tell you the order of this yet. It's something that I tutor yet. I couldn't tell you the order of this. I couldn't tell you the order up to 20. I had to learn that at year 11 level. I couldn't tell you that now. At your level, you should learn that. But if you don't, that's okay. You can get away with it. You get given the periodic table in all of your exams and all of your, of your SACs, of your tests, etc. That's just what comes up. You get given this. So that's why for me, I just think it's not a big, as big a deal as what it's made out to be. And I think that's a really important thing. So as you can see here, um, you these are the these are the uh, sort of molecules, atoms, I should say atoms, these are the atoms you need to know. Now all these atoms fall into different sort of sections. And notice how this periodic table sort of has a sort of structure to it. It's a bit different, but it has a bit of a structure. As you can see here, you've got hydrogen and all of these um, sort of non-metals. You've got halogens, so halogens all fall in one group. You've got noble gases, noble gases all fall in one group. And then you've got all your metals here. And these are also metals, but they're called transition metals. They're still metals, but they're called transition metals. So metals are usually here. You see this yellow line here. This yellow line indicates where metals stop. So everything on the left is metals except for hydrogen. And then all of these are non-metals plus hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a metal, it's its own thing, it's a little bit different. Notice how we call things groups and periods. So periods run across, so this is period one, all the way to here. Period two runs here, period three runs here. Now periods refer to valence electron shells. That's gonna sound like a very weird wording. We are gonna learn about it soon, so do not worry. Um, and then groups, these refer to sort of they don't really refer to anything chemically, but they have um, points where they discuss what's going on. So your group sort of have similar properties chemically and physically at times, and that will sort of tell you what's going on. So really important, this sort of periodic table is like, you're gonna be looking at these a lot. You're not expected to know how to draw one out. You're not expected to memorize it. Please do not, it's a waste of time, but you will go through these. Now, as you can see here, groups are the vertical columns. Um, two letters that reach downwards is a way of remembering it. You can just end up remembering it. I don't think you need some way, fancy way of remembering it. Um, periods are horizontal rows because they only have one letter that reaches downwards, so it's less. Look, if that helps you, go ahead and use it. If it doesn't, don't stress yourself with it. I don't think it's necessary for you to be utilizing little tools like that to remember it. I think you can remember it without it. Uh, groups tend to share similar characteristics. Um, so as you can see there, as I talked about, the groups, the vertical ones, they do sort of share similar characteristics. The periods, it's all about your sort of valence electrons. 
Um, the groups we are concerned about are the alkalil earth metals, transition metals, halogens, and noble gases. These last two are ones that you'll know really well. These first two you'll sort of know a little bit about, but it's not a really big deal. Halogens and noble gases, really cool. So, just a couple other things as well. There are other sort of things that are on the table that you'll learn as you go through that are different. So you have metals, metalloids, and gases. So metals are essentially just pure metals, such as aluminium, such as copper, such as steel, such as iron. These are pure, steel's technically not pure, so steel's not a bad example, don't listen to that one, but iron. These are pure metals. Pure metals that are shiny, they're malleable, so that means I can hit it really hard with a hammer and it'll just bend. Um, so think about it if you've seen those like, um, it's also a bad example because they're slightly different, but I think you're like, you've probably watched a movie or a TV show where, um, they've used, you know, ancient, not ancient, they're at like, you know, the Camelot times, so like the, the knight, the knighthood times and they're, you know, they're getting their swords and they're dipping it in the coal water and they're hitting them with a hammer, they're pulling them out of the fire. Notice how they don't shatter. That's because they're malleable. They can bend, they can change. Think of it like that. Ductility. Ductility refers to the ability to make a wire out of metal. So all of our wires and all of our machinery, it's metal. It's ductility. They're silvery. Um, they have a high boiling point and melting point. They're really good electron conductors, which means, um, or electrical conductors, which means that they can conduct electricity, which is why we make them into wires in the first place. Can they move our charge and therefore we have electricity movement? Um, they're also really good heat conductors. What's a really good example of that? Pots and pans. Your pots and pans move electricity through. So that's also one thing that makes them really good. Um, metalloids, on the other hand, these um, have some metallic and some non-metallic properties. So some metalloids can be uh, ductile, but also be colored. So they're not like silvery and shiny. Others are a little bit different. These are metalloids. You will learn which of these are metalloids in the periodic table, don't stress. Gases, these are essentially dull, they're not malleable, they're not ductile, they can be colourful, they usually have a really low boiling point and melting point, that's why they exist as gases, um, but if you did cool them down far, like to a really, really cold temperature, far enough down that you ended up with, you know, your, uh, your sort of solid, you'd find that they're not good electrical conductors, they're bad heat conductors, they're not ductile, you'd find they don't have any of those properties. Now, the groups that we discussed before, your alkalil or your alkalil uh, earth metals, these have a low melting point and boiling point. They're soft, they have a high density, um, and they're highly reactive. Now, we'll talk about our Gs in a bit, so don't worry about that. Um, transition metals, everything's different, so don't worry too much about it, but they have metallic properties, um, but it's really dependent on the element as to what how strong those metallic properties are. Um, your halogens, these are gases um, at sort of STP, which is just room temperature, if you like to think of it like that. They exist in pairs of atoms and they're reactive and they're colorful. So I wanna talk about halogens very quickly. Halogens here are these molecules here. So halogens exist as pairs because they share their last electron. Now we will discuss this in a little bit more detail, but essentially, Elements want to have a full electron shell. They want to share. Um, they want to share their last electron. They want to end up with a full electron shell. Now, a full electron shell for most of all of these will be eight. Um, so, especially these first two, they will be eight, and they've each got they've each got seven because they're in the seventeenth group. This one will just have two shells. This one will have three shells because it's in the third period. So being in the third period and being in the 17th group, it has seven in its outer shell. It's got three shells. Its outer shell has seven. It wants eight. So it will pair an electron with its with another chlorine. So essentially what it will do is it will share one of its electrons in a sense to sort of share one back. So it gets sort of one back. Essentially what that means is you end up with this idea that with one of these electrons being shared, um, you sort of end up with two. So you get one shared there, one shared there. So you end up with these shared sort of pairings and you end up with this idea that you end up with an extra electron. So this is Cl2 in a sense, you get F2, etc., so forth like that. Um, now apologies if you're still transitioning color because I'm doing this at like nine o'clock at night and the, my computer goes into that blue light thing. 
um, the yellow light, non-blue light thing. So you probably just saw that there. We apologize for that. Um, nonetheless, going back, um, your noble gases exist as singular atoms. Now, this is really important. Now, I need to go back again. Now, these are because these already have a full outer shell. So why would I share anything? If I've got everything I want, why would I share? That is precisely what is happening here. So these don't share anything because they've already got a full outer shell. They don't want to do anything. They're pretty stable. They want to do what they want to do. So essentially, that's what goes on there. So that's what you need to know from each of those sort of groupings. Now we're going to jump back into atom structure and atomic mass. So atoms are made up of three types of subatomic particles, and this is where we get more into why our periodic table is built the way it is. Atoms all are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positive because they are pro-everything. Neutrons are nothing. They are neutral because they are neutral people. Electrons are negative because why not? Everyone else is sort of positive or nothing. I'll be the opposite. They're negative. Now, relative mass. Protons essentially provide a mass of one. Don't worry about what that is, one gram, one microgram, don't worry, it's nothing. We're just calling it one. There's no, no units here, we call it one. It's one of the few times I'll ever say there's no units. Neutrons, what do they supply? One. Same thing, one. Electrons, what do they supply? Electrons supply one over 1,800. So you know what that means? That means absolutely nothing. They supply nothing. There is no mass that we say. So we say it's negligible mass for an electron, so they don't go towards the mass. The charge. The charge of a proton, positive. Neutrons, neutral. Electrons, negative. However, the charge are equal. One proton equals one electron in charge. So if I have one proton and one electron, they cancel each other out and I'm neutral. Really important. Despite the fact the masses are different, they are equal. Location is really important. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus. They make up the mass. Your mass is purely the nucleus of your atom. The electrons are found in the shells, which are surrounding the atom. So as you can see here, oh, coming too far, coming back, you have your nucleus in the middle here. So right here, this is your nucleus. Oh, I'm in the wrong, I was on the wrong page. That's your nucleus. These are your shells. So notice how this shell has two, this shell has three, so therefore, Given the fact that protons and neutrons are just wrong, there's probably more electrons around here. I'm not even going to say what this molecule is because it's probably just wrong. Nonetheless, um, but as you can see, this would be a non full outer shell. It wants to have eight. It doesn't have eight, so we've got three, so it's not happy. Uh, but nonetheless, as you can see here, this is your mass of your molecule. This is your relative atomic mass. That's where you get that from. So, your atomic structure and atomic mass. This is one of the points they talk about. They want you to talk about the basic structure, but they also need to talk about how do I calculate the relative atomic mass? And you might say to me, what the heck does it mean by relative atomic mass? Why can't I just say atomic mass? Really good point. Relative atomic mass is because of this phenomena called isotopes. Now think of it like, think of it like, I don't even know how to think about it, just think about it like atoms. What is the best way to think about it? Let's talk about carbon for our main one. So carbon has uh, six protons and six neutrons normally. So carbon is carbon. It's the sixth molecule on your periodic table. Being the sixth molecule on your periodic table, something I should have discussed before, each of these molecules have their number, their, atom their, um, their atomic number, this atomic here, their atomic number refers to the number of protons they have. So this has three protons, this has four protons, this has five protons, carbon has six protons. Now, we learnt back on this last slide that the relative atomic mass of carbon is 12.011. Now, you might say to me, how the heck do I have 12.011? It's like, you're counting protons and neutrons, you're going to get a whole number. It's just like, you ask someone how many pets they have in the house, and they say two and a half. You're like, what do you mean by a half? And they're like, well, I've got a fish. It doesn't count. You, you have three pets. You don't have two and a half. So, you can't have an odd or a decimal number of protons and neutrons. So then you say to me, well, how the heck did I get 12.011? Well, it's because it's relative, and relative refers to isotopes. So isotopes are essentially atoms of the same element that have a different atomic masses. So carbon, there is so much carbon in the world. You'd have bazillions, you have trillions of carbon atoms just in you, just in you yourself. Outside of that, there are 
unfathomable numbers of carbon atoms around the world. Unfathomable. You cannot even just consider the number. There are so many. So given that idea, not every single carbon is going to have the exact same number of neutrons. It just isn't possible. Yes, every single carbon has the same number of protons because if it had 13 protons, it's not carbon. That's a really, really important fact. You might say to me, well, what about the proton? Well, then a carbon might have a different number of protons. Well, then it's no longer carbon. It's a different atom. The atom is dependent on the protons. Really, really important. But nonetheless, every single one is going to have, you know, they're going to have different numbers of neutrons. So what we like to think with carbon is we, as a generalization, we've sort of taken massive quantities of carbon and we've figured out generally what are the percentages of each. We don't know exactly, but we know to a pretty, pretty high degree what there are. And we know that about 99% of carbon is carbon-12. It has six protons, it has six neutrons. We also know that about 0.8% of carbons are carbon-13. So they have six protons and they have two neutrons and they have uh, seven neutrons. And we know very, very small number, it's like 0.1 or 0.2% of all carbons are carbon-14, um, carbon but they have six protons and eight neutrons. So when you make that a relative atomic mass and you do the maths as to what is the average over the three, your average is 12.011. That's why a lot of people will just refer to carbon as 12. Their atomic mass is just 12. They'll simplify it down. But if you want to be really nitty gritty, you get in a relative atomic mass about 12.001, which is really, really um, very close to 12 because most of them are 12. So that's, that's because of isotopes. So isotopes are those different variations. The radioisotopes are isotopes that are unstable and decay radioactively. Carbon-13 and 14 are examples of that. They're not very stable, and that's why there's low percentages of them. So as we said, they're different forms of atoms of an element with the same number of protons and electrons but different number of neutrons. Isotopes have the same chemical properties because they have the same number of electrons but different physical properties due to the different number of neutrons. You can then be stable or unstable. So stable isotopes do not undergo radioactive decay. So it doesn't emit radiation, but unstable isotopes do go under radioactive decay and they will emit radiation. So it's one of those aspects you do need to know about the difference between the two. Um, isotopes, essentially atoms are the same element as you can see there. This is what I was talking about earlier. You've got your carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. And if you look at your um, protons and neutrons, your protons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, neutrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Exactly what I was trying to talk about, and that is why these are isotopes. Uh, so different isotopes um, are found at varying amounts. As you can see here, this is this was, these are the exact percentages I was looking for, the ones that I was more likely to do. Um, but as you can see that we assume that about 98.9% was 99%, but close to of carbon is 12, whilst 1.11% of it is carbon-13. And then, as I said here, carbon-14, such a small percentage, I thought it was like 0 0.1, but maybe it's way, 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 way less, um, is because it just doesn't exist. It's very unstable. So as you can see here, um, isotopic elements, you write the element, you write the mass number, you write the atomic number here. So you will write your elements a bit differently for this. So you'll write, you know, carbon-13-6. Carbon-13-6, carbon-14-6, carbon-12-6. So each of your isotopes, you need to be able to write them out differently. Um, so as you can see here, carbon-14 is a radioisotope. As I said here, that's an example of it. You already know what radioisotopes are. I've discussed a bit. Now, there's also decay. This is one thing that slightly alters from VCE to HSC, but I have been through this before at a university level, so it should be pretty fine. Essentially, you have alpha, beta, and gamma decay. Now, Gamma decay is the one that's really, really harmful. Um, it's really dangerous to be around gamma decay, gamma radiation a lot. That's things like, um, I believe if I'm thinking correctly, these are things such as like our um, nuclear power plants that have melted down. So there's one in Japan and you have like um, Chernobyl is another example they emit gamma radiation. Now, that's why we've built big concrete things around them. They also do produce a bit of alpha and beta. The concrete kind of gets rid of the alpha and beta. The gamma radiation, there's not a lot you can do. We sort of lead plate as well as we can, but it's pretty hard to get around. Um, 
but essentially alpha decay occurs in isotopes of the heaviest elements um, to remove mass, i.e. when there's too many nucleons. So what they'll do is they'll remove a, a neutron, but essentially it's really the heavy elements. They don't really care too much about it. So they get rid of something that's pretty heavy. Being so heavy, they have a really strong ionizing power, but their penetration power is terrible. So if they do hit something, they can do a bit of damage, but they, they can't penetrate very well. So therefore, you can get a sheet of paper and the neutron's too big to get through. So it's just going to get stopped. Um, beta, on the other hand, um, it's an unstable nuclei that contains too many neutrons um, and uh, electron is emitted as a beta particle. So essentially what we do is we actually emit electrons instead. So because we have too many neutrons, they there's issues with the mass and so forth. They actually emit a electron first. They then sort of move to alpha decay afterwards and they go, all right, I'm sick and tired of this neutron. I'm going to get rid of it. This just emits a uh, an, an electron, as I said. Electrons are a lot smaller. Therefore, you actually need sort of a metal plate to stop it. So aluminium, is a, it's not very dense, but it's dense enough. Um, and that's what's going on there. Where gamma radiation is energy. We're not actually emitting anything, we're just emitting energy. And because you're emitting energy, there's not, it's really hard to stop. And therefore you need like a really thick plate of lead. Lead has a really high density and a really high ability to absorb energy, but you still need it really thick. So essentially what it is, it looks like this. Um, so that's gamma. And essentially gamma is just, it's just really high level energy. It's got really high penetrating power, which just has low ionizing power, it's really high penetrating power. It's what makes you very sick. You get, uh, you experience a lot of this, it's really unhealthy, you don't want this to occur, and therefore, that's why it's really dangerous. Um, so as you can see here, with alpha decay, um, as you can see here, you, alpha decay causes the atomic number to decrease by two, so you go A4 to Z2, and the mass number to decrease by four. So alpha particle is the equivalent to a helium nucleus. Beta, on the other hand, occurs when there is an excess neutron. So a neutron decomposes into a proton and an electron. Um, essentially, the atomic mass increases by one. And then gamma radiation particles are released. Uh, gamma particles are released when the atom has too much energy. Due to being energy, there is no change in the atomic mass or number. So, Radioisotopes, we've already discussed this. Um, they can be helpful in many real world situations such as imaging, historical dating, medical treatments, etc. The reason they're really, really useful in historical dating is because we understand that they have half life. So there's, a, there's the half life of a lot of radioisotopes is really long. We're talking tens of thousands of years. After tens of, tens of thousands of years, half of the amount of radioisotope you have in a sample or you expect to have in a sample should have reacted, should have emitted off its, its radiation and gone. It should have emitted what it needed to and stabilized itself. So over time you can take samples and go, all right, well, there's this much. I should have had this much if it was at 100%. Therefore I can tell it was this old. So that's sort of how you do it. Carbon-14 is a man-made isotope, so it's extremely rare cases uh, where it occurs naturally. Undergoes beta decay used in carbon dating, so useful for estimating fossil ages. As it says man-made, it's because it comes from fossils, it comes from humans. Um, so it is sort of still occurring naturally, but one of those things. The other one that's really cool is uranium-238. It's a naturally occurring radioisotope. It undergoes alpha decay, and it's used for making nuclear power and generating nuclear, and generating nuclear power. But the problem is the way that we work with it ends up producing a bit of gamma and it gets really dangerous. Um, so what are atoms like? What do they look like? So now that we've gone through a bit of decay and what's going on, what do atoms actually look like? So we like to look at what we referred to as Bohr's model. Now, none of you should have seen this movie being in year 11, but I'm sure some of you might have gone with your parents. Um, and you may have seen the movie Oppenheimer. The Bohr that they actually discuss that he meets when he is at university in Germany, uh, when he goes to Germany when he's younger, is actually Neil Bohr. It's the same bloke. This is his theory. So it's kind of cool for me. That movie was actually kind of cool in terms of seeing this. I actually saw, I was like, wow, these are people that, you know, I've learned what they are discussing. Yes, they are just actors playing them, but at the same time, it's cool seeing that, you know, real life history being played out. But essentially, in Bohr's model of an atom, there are fixed energy levels that electrons are found in, and these are known as electron shells. So electrons move from a lower energy to a high energy when they absorb energy. 
this is known as excited, and they, um, when excited electrons immediately return to the original or low energy levels known as ground state. So essentially what they do is they move up really quickly and they move back down really quickly. So they go up, oh, I'm excited, oh, oh, I'm back. It's like an immediate up and down. Um, in this process, they release that excess energy that they absorb. So they absorb energy and they move forward and they go, actually, I don't want this energy. They go back and they release it. That release energy comes out as light. Um, and you can sort of read what light energy is coming out and say, all right, it was this color or it was this intensity. Therefore, I can say that I'm working with these, these levels of energy in these, these shells. It's actually something you can do. So as you can see here, you've got three shells here. You've got some energy that hits an electron. You've got a low energy state. You've got a high energy state. The electron moves up into an excited state. It goes, oh, I'm really excited right now. I've got a lot of energy. I move forward. So it moves into this excited state. And then it goes back down. And when it goes back down, it re-releases the energy, but it transitions it into a sort of a light approach. So now it's like acting as a light. So this energy has gone up and now it comes back down and goes, all right, I don't want this energy anymore. I'm getting rid of it. And it gets rid of it the way, best way it can and it does that by emitting light. So as you can see here, there are a whole bunch of shells that you need to know. And the number of electrons that are in them is determined by two times n squared. So if I say I have two shells, I go two squared is four, two times four is eight. If I go, all right, now I have three. So I go three squared, three squared is nine, nine times two, 18. Now I have four, so I go four squared, that's 16 times two, I have 32. So the max number of electrons changes depending on the number of shells. However, you will only ever really work with four shells and your fourth shell, you will only ever really work up to two more. So you only work up to about 20 electrons usually. You can go further. You will discuss it at some times in some occasions, but most of the time you're maximally going to go to 20 electrons. So you're going to go max in the shell is two, max in the outer shell is, is eight, max in the outer shell is, is another eight and then so forth. But we'll discuss this in a second. But as you can see here, this is sort of what we were discussing. This is Bohr's model. So his model can only explain the emission spectra of one element, hydrogen. And there are a lot of assumptions in this model, which he could not explain, but could, be, but could sort of prove most of them to be true. So we switched to sort of Schrodinger's model. So Schrodinger's was the next model to come along. Schrodinger essentially took Bohr's model um, and he improved it with quantum mechanics. So he kind of went to the next level. So electrons are now considered to have a wave-like property. So if those of you have done physics, and this is the reason, this is a sort of a very technical part of chemistry that you don't need to know in super duper detail. But what you'll find is that in physics, you discuss this idea that light and particles act both in a wave, but also not in a wave. And it's kind of this hard idea to get your head around that they act they have properties of both and you're like, I have no idea what's going on. Don't worry. Scientists who have studied their entire life still don't know what's going on. You don't need to figure it out. But electrons are thought to have a wave-like property as well as just a physical property. And so he suggested that the electrons were not in orbit, but rather they were in a cloud in region space, which we call orbits. Now these orbits he still referred to a shell. So he said, all right, they're in a shell. This is the major energy within the atom, but they also have subshells, and these are energy levels within these shells. So you have an S, a P, a D, and an F. There's a lot more, but these are the first couple. And then you have orbitals. So orbitals are essentially the regions within these subshells where electrons are found. Now, you don't need to know about orbitals. It's probably a bit too far. You're not going to discuss them all that much. But as you can see, this is sort of what we sort of looked at. These are energy levels. And then these are sort of where they were in their shells. So this is in the second shell, the third shell, the fourth shell. And we sort of discussed that from there. So we can represent the subshell using box notation. Essentially what you have is you have 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. So each, each box contains two electrons. The arrows represent the electrons with one in the up position and one in the down position. The s subshell has one box. The P subshell has three boxes, the D subshell has five boxes, and the F has seven. 
This is due to a different principle which states that each ore can contain a maximum of two electrons. It's also because we like to pair electrons and electrons like to pair up. Now it's something you will learn as you go through chemistry, but electrons pair up. They do this thing where they pair up with each other. Now, what's also really important is that there's like an order to this stuff. Um, and essentially it goes 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, and then you go back to sort of like 2d. Um, no, sorry, you won't go back to it. And then you'll go, so you go 3s, 3p, and then you'll go 4s, 4p, and then back to 3d. So you're not going to have to worry about that too much because it's not something you're going to discuss. Um, it's not something you're going to go to. But at this level, you need to understand the order is 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. Really important. That's the order in which the electrons fill. So they're going to fill 1s first, then 2s second, and then 2p next, then 3s, then 3p. So, I want you to have a go at these. So, um, write the electron configuration for carbon using SPDF notation. As you can see here, we've already gone ahead and done that. And it says draw the electron configuration of carbon using SPDF box notation. So, we've already done the first part for you. This is the SPDF notation. So, it's 1s squared because there's two electrons in it, 2s squared because there's two electrons in it again. So S, again, is the subshell, one is the main shell, and two, the number at the top, to the power of is the number of the number of electrons that are in that, that sort of subshell. 2S, same thing, 2P, same thing, there's, except this time there's two, no, well, it's P, and there's two again because we only have six electrons because it's the sixth element, so six electrons. So that's why we get that two there again. Now. I want you to have a go at drawing the electron configuration of the carbon. So you've been given the, using the box notate, notation, sorry. So you're gonna use the box notation. We've already done the SPDF notation. I want you to give the box notation. And then I also want you to do it for silicon. Now I want you to do both for silicon. We're not gonna give you this part for silicon. Best way to go about this, if you don't have a, a periodic table up, get one up, just search it up, periodic table. Or you're welcome to pause the video here on the periodic table. I'm giving it to you here. So you can figure out where silicon is. You can figure out how many electrons it's going to need, etc. But the best way to go at this question is for you, I want you all to pause and then come back to it. Um, well, I'm just finding the question again. Here's the question. So what I want you to do is pause. I'll give you a little bit of time. Um, take a couple of minutes to do this question and then unpause and I'll go straight into it so there's no you know, gap in the recording. The three, two, one, pause, and hopefully you're back. So hopefully you had a go at that question. Hopefully you took a couple of minutes. Um, nonetheless, we're going to go through it. So first of all, we've already done the carbon SPDF notation just here, but this is what it looks like when you do the box notation. So what's really interesting about this box notation is that you're going to fill the up arrows first. It's something we didn't discuss initially. So you might have got that wrong initially, and I do apologize. I didn't really discuss it. But you do the up arrows first, and then you do the down arrows. So you always feel the up arrows in your P first, and then you do your down arrows next. So if you did up and down, that's okay. I understand. But in this case, you do your up arrows first. So therefore, for silicon, it would be very much similar. Your P is going to have your up arrows first. As you can see here, you've got 1S, 2S. They're both squared because there's only two possible. Then you go to your 2P. Now, there are six possible, so you put six squared. You then go to your 3s, there's only two possible, so you put your two. Then you go to your 3p and there's actually only two in there, so you put your two. So most of these are twos, there's one six in there. But that's only because you couldn't fill this one anymore. Um, so as you can see, this is the order in which you do it. This is the order in which you fill. So you go 1s, then you go 2s, then you go 2p to 3s, 3p to 4s, 3d to 4p to 5s to 4D to 5P to 6S. So that is the sort of Pauli principle. Um, the It's also sort of these other two principles or these other two rules. These also sort of discussed it. The, the thing was at this period in time, it was such a race in chemistry. So everyone was producing theories at the same time. You're going, ah, oh, this is the right theory. No, this is the right theory. No, this is the right theory. No one wanted to work together. Um, partly because of wars, partly because of political differences, but no one wanted to work together. So because of that idea that no one wanted to work here, that everyone just claimed it. So therefore, there are different principles and rules that state the exact same thing that everyone sort of listens to and everyone goes, all right, we, 
we don't really want to, you know, pick one person over the other. In science, it's very much like if they all figured it out at the same time, then they all should be credited with it. So we give things multiple names. This is one of those things where we give them multiple names. Their rules are slightly different, but pretty much saying the same thing. This is how you fill your boxes. So here's a question here. Which of the following is not a method that can be used to separate homogeneous mixtures? So revision. So as you'll see throughout these slides, there's going to be a bit of revision. We're going to jump back and forth. That's because I want you to sort of touch on what you just did. It's a good learning method and it's something we'll discuss later on as a really good learning method. And this is a really good point in time just to sort of take that pause and go, all right, we're about, you know, a bit over 70 minutes into this. This is this point in time where you go, all right, let's do some practice questions, let's punch some out and then we'll push into this last. We really only have about 35 minutes left after these questions. So hopefully we'll be done just under two hours, but you'll see um, that after this, we've got bonding and bonding shouldn't take us more than about 30, 35 minutes to go through. So which of the following is not a method that can be used to separate homogeneous mixtures? All right, I want you to take a second, three, two, one, pause, and hopefully back. So hopefully you paused, hopefully you had a go at that question. It shouldn't have taken you more than about a minute. Um, so remember when we went through this, you want to separate a homogeneous mixture, we need to use one of the first three methods. So we needed to use the evaporation, the filtration. So the filtration got rid of the solids, evaporation got rid of the liquid and left the solid, and fractional distillation did the two liquids. Decanting is a little bit different. This is more for heterogeneous mixtures. Um, so as you can see here, you cannot pour off the top as something is evenly dispersed. Because they're evenly dispersed, you cannot use decanting. All right, now we have another one. So we have explained where each of the following elements would belong in the periodic table. So a malleable and lustrous solid, an unreactive gas, a soft solid that reacts readily with water, a brittle solid that conducts electricity and heats fairly well. So what types of, what, what parts of the periodic table are going to explain each of these? So I want you to have a go at this question. I'm going to give you... This question should take you around, look, you've got two, two marks for each. And give yourself a minute and a half, if not two minutes for each question. You probably should get on a flow and finish it a bit quicker than, you know, eight minutes. But, you know, give yourself at least five minutes to get through this. If not, take up to eight. Have, have a go at this, take your time. I'll give you time to pause now, three, two, one. And hopefully you're back. So, as you can see here, you've got a malleable lustrous solid, you've got an unreactive gas, you've got a soft solid that reacts deadly with water, so this is solubility. You've got a brittle solid that conducts electricity. So if I was going through this, the first one I'd think about is, is unreactive gas. Unreactive gas. We talked about it, which of the gases does not want to do anything? What, which of the gases is really comfortable with who it is, doesn't want to share anything? Noble gas. Malleable lustrous, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about metals. Uh, solid, a soft solid that readily that reacts readily with water. Hmm. It's an interesting one. You probably think like non-metals, metalloids, a few different ones you can think about there. We'll discuss that in a little bit. And then a brittle solid that conducts electricity and heat fairly well. Again, we're probably looking at metalloids, something that we'll discuss. Um, as you can see here, this is how they discussed it. Now, if your answers look very different, don't worry. This is a really weirdly worded question in terms of this is not a SAC level or an exam level question. It's more about just pushing your learning. So, a malleable illustrious solid is towards the left of the periodic table amongst the metals, likely in group two, since group one metals are too reactive to be malleable. That's a little fact I wouldn't have expected you to know at this point in time, but it's a good one to learn. This is a, these are great questions for learning. Um, an unreactive gas. So an unreactive gas is on the right of group eight with the noble gases, since this is the group of inert gases. Should have known that. That was a pretty, good, pretty straightforward sort of question. Um, this one here says likely group one, since elements on the left of the pro table are softer and are most reactive, are the furthest to the left. So um, that's probably what you're going to be thinking there. A soft solid that rarely absorbs. That's a pretty decent answer. And then a brittle solid that conducts electricity. Left of the non-metals, since metals are malleable and conductive, while non-metals are brittle and non-conductive, these mixed characteristics make it a metalloid. So as you saw here, a metalloid is sort of just 
in between metals and non-metals. And then these are the other ones here. So these are tough questions, but they're not exam style questions. These are the sort of questions that you would do uh, sort of throughout the year just to, to solidify your learning and to even use them as a learning point. Like some of these points I may not have even known as well if I hadn't read through these questions. So it's a really good point to just sort of learn. All right, another multiple choice. We have a student conducting an experiment to measure the amount of gas generated when different uh, masses of reactants were mixed in 100 ml of water. The experiment is shown below, which the following correctly identifies the, the, the variables of this experiment. So I want you to have a go at this question. I'll give you your time now. I'd say this is maybe a one to two minute question. If you need more time, feel free to take it. But again, three, two, one, pause. And... Hopefully you're back. So, which of the following correctly identifies the variables of uh, the experiment? So, it says here that we want to conduct a to measure the amount of gas generated from different masses. Different masses. We are changing that. So, massive reactant is your independent variable. So, you can rule out B and you can rule out D. You're left with A or C. Then it says that your dependent variable is temperature or volume of gas collected. Well, we we are measuring the amount of gas. It says in the question, measure amount of gas. Remember the dependent variable, you're looking at what you're measuring. So you're not measuring temperature, measuring volume of gas. I think my answer here is C. Let's just check a control variable. Well, we want to keep the temperature the same because we don't want the temperature to manipulate how much gas is being produced. So therefore, temperature will be a control variable. C is your best answer here. C. All right, question 10. Write the SPDF configurations for each of the following. So aluminium, chlorine, fluorine, sodium, uh, iron. Again, use your periodic table. Again, you should have one up. If you don't have one up, give me one second and you can quickly pause the video at this point here. You can quickly pause and do each of your uh, SPDF uh, configurations. But if not, come back to here, have a go at this one here. You've got a, B, C, or D. So you've got these three here. Have a go at this one here. And um, pause the video in three, two, one, pause. And hopefully you're back. So hopefully you're back and you had a go at this one. Again, just use the periodic table. It's a pretty straightforward sort of, um, pretty straightforward sort of way of doing it. So you've got aluminium, fluorine, fluorine, and sodium ions. Again, look at how many protons I have that have the same amount of electrons. So aluminium here has uh, 13 protons, so therefore you're gonna have 13 electrons. So you're gonna do your two, your one S2, two S2, two P6, you're at 10 now, three S2, 12, three P1. Chlorine on the other hand has uh, 17, I think it is. So two, two, and six is your 10. And the two is 12 and then five is your 17. Fluorine has nine, so again, two, two, and five, and your sodium has 10, so two, two, and six. So let's move into our last section. Now, again, as I said before, this should take about 30, 35 minutes to get through. Um, we're about 80 minutes in, so that should push us to about an hour 50, which is about perfect. Um, so let's push through this last little bit. Um, and go through our bonding. Now, bonding is super duper important. I kind of like I, I cannot stress it enough how important bonding is. Bonding is like the description of everything. Bonding is just super duper important. Like I cannot describe to you how important bonding is. Like it's really really important to know your bonding. Um, so please know your bonding really well. It's going to come up. It's just. It's, it's something that comes up in your, your sort of your main HSC chemistry all the time. It comes up in BC chemistry, which I tutor all the time. It is just, you need to know it. So you have two sort of main types of bonds. So we have ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Now you'll learn to split it up differently as you go along, but we'll start off with ionic and compound and covalent, and then we'll split it differently as we move along. But ionic compounds are essentially compounds with consistent of non-metal and metal chemically bonded together. Now, a better way of thinking about this is if I have a metal. Now, metals are generally positively charged. Let's just say they're positively charged. So, a metal is sodium. Sodium is Na+. 
singular charge. That's its ion form. Chlorine, on the other hand, is a non-metal. Chlorine is negative one. Because that is a positive charge and that is a negative charge, they like to bond together. They, with their different polarities, bond together. And that is an ionic compound. That is what that is. Covalent compounds, on the other hand, are compounds which consist of only non-metal compounds bonded together. Now, a covalent compound is such as like a hydrocarbon. Now, a hydrocarbon is like petrol. Petrol is a bunch of carbons in a really long chain with hydrogens attached to it. That really long chain, there's no difference in the sort of ions being positive or negative. It's a really important point. So then the ions are not necessarily positive or negative. They're sort of, they're all sort of similar. So essentially you don't get this difference. You don't get these differences. You essentially just get one long chain. Um, and that is essentially a covalent mixture, a covalent compound. So, electronegativity. Electronegativity will help us bonding a lot more because electronegativity refers to the tendency of atoms to attract a bonding pair of electrons. So, fluorine is the most electronegative element. Um, electronegativity determines how likely an atom is to attract an electron and form a bond. The difference in electronegativity between two bonding atoms can be used to determine the ionic or covalent nature of the bonds. So, as you can see here, fluorine is the strongest. Noble gases don't have any because they don't attract. So all of the electronegativity goes sort of up in this arrow, goes towards this point. So as you move right across your periods, so as I move right across my periods, I become more electronegative. As I move up in my groups, I also become more electronegative. Really important way of thinking about it. So ionic bonds require the transfer of electrons from the metal to the non-metal, whereas covalent bonds only involve the sharing of electrons. So what I what I want you to think about before is we had these ions. So I had Na plus and I had Cl minus. Why was Na plus a thing? Well, if I go back to my periodic table, which was on my last slide, Na is here. So sodium is at 11. So what does that mean for its, its groups and its, uh, sh its shell structure? Bit of a tongue twister, shell structure. What it means for its shell structure is that sodium goes 1s, 2s, 2p6. So it fills its p and its s, and then it starts a 3s1. Who wants to be a 3s1? You're only stable when you have 8 in your outer shell, minus that first shell. So no one wants to have, no one wants to have 1 in its outer shell. So what does sodium do? Sodium knocks off one of its electrons and goes, I don't, I don't need you. I'd rather be positively charged than have these extra electrons. That's what it does, it knocks off that electron. That electron gets knocked off and it goes and it goes, all right, well, what about a molecule over here that really wants an electron? Well, chlorine really wants an electron because chlorine has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So it's got two full air shells, two full shells. And then it's got a 3s2, and then it's got a 3p5. Why would I want to be a 3p5? I'd rather be a 3p6 and be full. That's what it does. It collects another electron. So it collects that electron from that sodium, and essentially by collecting it, they become bonded together. So by knocking off that electron, and by chlorine accepting it, they become bonded together. So essentially, they have it has given an electron. Whereas covalent bonding, on the other hand, shares electrons. Covalent, actually, they share an electron between the two of them. So, the greater the difference in electronegativity forms ionic bonds. So, if you have a really big difference, so across this group, across this period, sorry, sodium has a really, really low electronegativity, chlorine has a really high one, they form an ionic bond. Smaller difference, where if I look at carbon bonding to another carbon, there's no difference there. Therefore, they form a covalent bond because they share that electron. Um, and the different strengths of electronegativity depend on how much they share. So if something's more electronegative, so if I'm looking at two elements bonding together, so I'm looking at carbon and fluorine bonding together, or actually a better example is carbon and oxygen. They bond together a lot. So when carbon and oxygen bond together a lot, um, think of like carbon dioxide, CO2, um, they share an electron because they're pretty similar electronegativity and because there's a really small difference in the electronegativity as it says here 
you form covalent bonds. However, oxygen still is slightly stronger. It's slightly more electronegative. So by being slightly more electronegative, what does it do? It attracts the electron slightly more than what carbon gets. And it's like getting, it's like, you know, um, probably a terrible example, but it's the only one that comes to my mind. It's like uh, divorced parents sharing kids and one of them gets them four days a week and the other one gets them three. It's like electronegativity. It's a terrible example, but it's sort of what I was trying. I'm trying to think of a better example in my mind. I can't think of one. Um, it's like when you're sharing chips with your mate and you eat quicker than them. So it's like bad luck, buddy. I ate all the chips. Same sort of thing. I'm trying to think of a good example. I cannot think of a good one. So that's sort of what I'm trying to say. But essentially, um, when these two bond together, this oxygen takes more of the electron. By taking slightly more of the electron, there is a very, very slight negative charge on the oxygen. Very, very slight. Just because it takes the electron a little bit more. The carbon, on the other hand, becomes a tiny bit positive. It's very, very slight. We don't even call it positive. We just say it's slightly positive. It's this tiny little bit of positive charge. That difference in sharing the electron makes that molecule polar. So as we talked about earlier, polarity, it makes that molecule polar. Polar molecule. That's essentially what we call that there. Um, so that's what happens with hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen, it's actually covalent bonding. Hydrogen is actually more like sits over here in terms of strength of electronegativity. So they're actually quite close to each other just because of this gap. It's a little bit different. Essentially, these two are actually quite close to each other in electronegativity. Um, and essentially, they have covalent bonds, but the oxygen is slightly stronger in attraction. So... Compounds just consist of non-metals and metal will bond together by ionic bonds. Essentially, as you can see here, you've got a spare one here, doesn't want it, so it gives it over there, and that's an ionic bond. These form between cations, which are positively charged ions, and anions, which are negatively charged ions. Ionic bonds form, whoops, ionic bonds form and electronegativity differences are very different, and you get this table salt example of NaCl. Now, compounds which consist of non-metals chemically bonded together usually do covalent bonds and usually it's molecules are the exact same they have no difference in electronegativity so therefore they're going to share like this so example you've got all these here which are their own but then they share these two so this was one from this chlorine this one was from this chlorine and now they share them so covalent bonds form an electronegativity difference between the non-metals are relatively low so that's what's going on there so as you can see, you've got covalent bonds, electrons shared, and then you've got ionic bonds, so electrons transferred. So, bonding. Explore the similarities and differences between the nature of inter and intramolecular bonds. Now, this is more of the important side of things. This is more where I would split my bonding, where I would say, all right, this bonding is intermolecular, this bonding is intramolecular. I like to split my bonding here better than where I did it earlier. So intermolecular versus intramolecular bonds. It's really important you don't get these two words muddled up. You need to make sure you can separate them. Intermolecular, think of it like internet. The internet, you can go anywhere. You can do whatever you want. You can go whatever, wherever on the internet you want. Intranet is within a small space. So your school will have an intranet. Maybe you use Moodle or maybe you use a different program where it's online. You need internet to access it but essentially it's just shared files between your school. You can only access it through your school. It's got only school stuff on it. That's an intranet. It's an intranet because it's within a system. Internet is over the systems. So think about it in terms of molecules. Intramolecular bonds with an A, they are bonds within the molecule. So they are the covalent bonds where they share electrons Intermolecular bonds are if I had two separate molecules, so I had a chlorine and a chlorine, and my intramolecular bonds was those covalent bonds between the individual chlorine atoms. But now I've got one of them here, and I've got one of them here. What about between those two molecules? Is there attraction at all? Well, there is, and we call these intermolecular bonds. So they're between molecules. Um, so intra, you give covalent and ionic. Inter, we're going to talk about some different ones, such as dipole, hydrogen, and dispersion. So, you need to know this for year 12. They are responsible for differences in melting and boiling point. These are forces that tend to be tested more often. So, you have three different forces or three different types of in 
intermolecular bonds, dispersion forces, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen. Now these go in strength order. Dispersion is really weak. Dispersion is in everything. Everything has a dispersion force. When I pick up this drink bottle, there is a dispersion force between atoms in my drink bottle, plastic, and my finger. Yes, not it doesn't exactly explain why I'm picking this up. There are other things that explain that, but there is a dispersion force between those atoms. It's literally a thing that happens everywhere. Dipole, dipole are when you have polar molecules. So polar molecules are dipole and hydrogen. Non-polar is dispersion. Polar is also dispersion. There's dispersion between everything. Now, dipole, dipole, you need to be a polar molecule. So you need to have some slightly stronger, um, some slightly difference in electronegativity. So you need to have a slightly positive and a slightly negative area. And essentially, dipole, dipole is just between any polar molecules. Now, hydrogen are special types of dipole, dipole. So they're a type of dipole, dipole, but they're special. These are between what we call the NOF group, N-O-F. Hydrogen bonded to intermolecularly, so it's not like a full bond, it's just like an intermolecular bond between a nitrogen, oxygen, and a fluorine. So if a molecule has a hydrogen and it forms a dipole-dipole bond with another polar molecule that has a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine, it will form a hydrogen bond. This is slightly stronger than a dipole-dipole and can explain why melting points or boiling points increase a bit more in some molecules that have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or a hydrogen, although they need at least two of them. That's why we call it the NOF rule. Some people call it the FON rule. I call it the NOF rule for nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Now, it also wants you to investigate elements that possess physical properties of allotropy, or allotropy, I like to call it allotropy, um, and electropy, probably the better way of saying it. Sometimes I put H in there. Um, and then investigate the different chemical structures of atoms. So, allotropy, allotropy, I can never say it properly. Allotropy refers to when an element appears in different forms due to the differences in bonding between each form. So, graphite and diamond are literally made up of carbon. They are both made up of just carbon. Graphite and diamond look very, very different. So, oh, sorry, this got a bit squished up. I do apologize for that. I should, should have fixed that. But nonetheless, You'll get the point. Diamond and graphite are both made up of carbon. They're both networks of carbon. So carbon's a really cool molecule. However, diamond is a complex network, whereas graphite is distributed sheets. As you can see back here, this is like a really complex network where everything is sort of spaced out in weird ways. Graphite is a sheet. They're just sheets. Now, diamonds, because of this complex network, are the one of the hardest structures we know to man. That's why diamonds were initially so expensive. Not only were they pretty, they were so hard. So, so hard, we could barely work with them. And we went, you know what? This is cool. Made them expensive. And now they're really expensive. Graphite, on the other hand, um, is still strong, but it's brittle. So if I smash a graphite, a piece of graphite, it'll, it'll explode. Whereas... If I smash a, a diamond, it's probably not going to do anything. Nothing's going to happen. So, as you can see here, graphite has many layers where the carbons connect to, to three others. It consists of eas easily or even, I think I can say evenly distributed sheets. I don't think it's going to say easily. I think it's going to say evenly. Um, essentially, the soft sheets move apart as you hit them, and essentially they are brittle, so they break. Now, if you think about it, it's a really good way. Graphite is used in pencils, so you'll find those in pencils, whereas Diamonds, obviously, are in jewelry. Now, ionic networks are referred to as lattices, and that consists of grid altering positive and negative ions. So these are covalent bonds, remember? So carbon, carbon is covalent. Now, what if I had what if I had solid table salt? Table salt is a solid. So that is what we refer to as an ionic lattice because table salt is made up of sodium and chlorine. It's held together by... Um, ionic bonds. What's really important is they have to alternate. They have to have one positive, then one negative, then you know a negative, then a positive, then a negative, then a positive. Like They've got to be alternated. Think about it like balls in a little, in like a tub, and you've got to have them all alternated perfectly. What that also means is that if I hit that again, if I hit that ionic solid, if I hit a big thing of salt, I will push different layers against each other, and I'll push a positive, like let's just say I had a positive, and then a positive here, and I had negatives here. 
and I push this layer up and now there's positives next to each other, they don't like each other. What do they do? Explode apart. So they are also really brittle. So because of this, we find that ionic substances have really high and high, high melting points and boiling points because they're really strong, but they're also really brittle. So if you hit it really hard, it'll just shatter. Um, and that's really not a good thing. Um, they only conduct electricity in a liquid state um, because they don't have the ability for a charged particle to move throughout when they're in the lattice. If you melt them down and make them into a liquid, well, all the particles are moving, so you can conduct electricity. So this is what I was trying to describe, that sort of image there. Um, now, covalent networks, as we've already sort of mentioned, um, we just mentioned the sort of diamond and we mentioned the uh, graphite. Now, covalent networks are usually made up, they're always made up of non-metals, but they are usually made with continuous covalent bonding and they sort of go off into different directions. Um, they usually, again, have high melting and high boiling points. And again, they do not conduct electricity as there's no ions and the electrons are in a covalent bond and hence there is no free roaming electrons to conduct electricity. There's no charged particles within covalent networks to be able to move an electron along. So remember, covalents are non-metals. So the only thing that can conduct electricity as a solid is a metal, just a pure metal. A pure metal is the only thing that can conduct electricity as a solid. It's a really just... It's a rule you should know. It's a rule you should stick by. If it's not a pure metal, it's like a singular pure metal it cannot, that is a solid, it cannot conduct electricity. Um, liquids are a bit different because most liquids can, um, but it's just, it varies. Covalent liquids usually cannot. Um, the molecular formula covalent networks also represents the ratio of atoms, etc. Um, and we'll learn a lot more about covalent networks, particularly in organic chemistry. Um, so covalent molecular compounds are composed of non-metals that are held together by weak covalent bonding. Physical properties, they're not very hard. They're usually pretty malleable. Um, this is because the covalent bonds uh, have sheets of lattices like grids, which make it easy for these sheets to slide over each other. The only difference is sort of graphite, which is a little bit more break apart, a little bit more brittle, although it does sort of move okay. Um, it's not as brittle as an ionic substance. An ionic substance is super brittle. Um, they do not conduct electricity because they are all neutral. If an aqueous solution is created, they do not dissociate into iron. So again, they cannot conduct electricity ever. Um, so what we're trying to say here is that HCl here is sort of an example here. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. It can conduct electricity. Sorry, I just got that mixed up. So in an aqueous solution... Uh, they do dissociate into ions, so they can conduct electricity. So what I mean by that is, sorry, I've got those mixed up again. Essentially what happens is when you put a covalent molecular substance into a liquid form, so you melt it down, you end up with the ions again because there's so much, there's so much energy there that it breaks those covalent bonds. They're not that strong. So when you break those covalent bonds, your H positive and your Cl minus, if you had HCl, then become ions again and they're moving through that liquid and because they're charged they then conduct electricity so i got those completely mixed up you do conduct electricity as a covalent molecular um, substance as a liquid as you can see here here are some examples of it um, you know ice so forth now metallic structures these are very different because they do move electrons they do have the ability to move electrons when they are a solid, and therefore the ability to move electrons means they can move a charge. And when they can move in a charge, what does that mean? When they can move a charge, they are able to conduct electricity. So they're really, really interesting in that point. So in that point of view, we really like metals because metals conduct electricity. We put them in wires, we we sort of ductile, we ductile them into wires, and we utilize them in a lot of our sort of our structures and so forth. So essentially what we refer to this as, and this is a really key wording that you need to know throughout this year and you need to know next year, is that metallic structures consist of a seat of delocalized electrons within a lattice of metal cations. Um, this is the metallic bonding model. Um, and it's something that you'll see, and I don't know why there's no images of it here, and I really want to grab up an image. So what I'm going to do very quickly is move across, and hopefully you can still see this. Let me check my recording. You can still see this. All right, we're going to... I don't want my... You can look at my history in the Middle East, just slides. We're going to, ooh, lots of slides. Um, let's just quickly jump in and let's go metallic 
see of delocalized electrons, as you can see, I'm a terrible typer. All right, images. Let's find a random image in here. This is sort of what we mean. I think I like these images here, like like this. Like what we're trying to describe here is that there's the all of the metal exists as like a positive sort of. Um, they exist as like a positive. Uh, positive ion sort of in a like in a field and as much as it's a positive ion we're in like a field and because we're in a field or a solid and that field allows the electrons that are available to just float throughout so they just float throughout so they're just here and they're floating up here and they come down here and they go down here and they, and they float around they do what they want and then a charge gets applied over here and the electrons go ooh, they take that charge and they go ooh, and they move throughout and they move it throughout the wire and that's essentially why we refer to our electrons as having um, that idea of being, like our metal, sorry, having that idea of metals as a solid being able to conduct electricity because those electrons are delocalized and there is a sea of them and they can move around. Um, so this is the metallic bonding model. Um, and these electrons are called delocalized as valence electrons break away from the atoms, allowing these electrons to move throughout the lattice. They are held together by a long, by a long, a strong electrostatic attraction um, between the electrons and the ions within the lattice, latter eye lattice. So physical properties, they're really malleable, they're really ductile, so they can be pulled apart, they can be smashed, so forth. They can conduct electricity due to already having delocalized electrons. So having that charged particle that allows you to conduct electricity, allows the electricity to move throughout. And that's a really important point. Um, they have high boiling points and high melting points. So this is due to the strong electrostatic attraction. So more energy is needed to break these bonds. Um, the metallic bonding model cannot explain the variance between melting and boiling points, the magnetic nature of metals, the various electrical conductivity of metals. So there are some elements of metals which are really different. Some metals are magnetic, some metals are not. Some metals are conductive far more than others. The variance between melting and boiling points is considerable between metals. We don't have a good way of discussing that in terms of this whole um, metallic bonding ruling. Like we don't have a good way of doing that. And that's a really important point. There is no good way of discussing that using this whole metallic bonding model that we use. We do need, we can discuss that in terms of different models and it's something that we can talk about. We won't talk about it today. It's something you will go into detail in class and it's something that you will be expected to sort of know about. But that's a really good summary for what's going on. Um, and then we're just gonna quickly move into naming covalent molecules and then we're gonna do a couple of practice questions just to end off. So, Naming covalent molecules is really, really important. Um, the one, if you're naming a covalent substance, the one atom that is most metallic, the one that is you know on the left of the periodic table and usually on the start of the name uh, or start of the molecule, this will be named first. And then you may have to start with the prefix if they're named according to how many atoms they are and they usually end in "-ide". So, Name the following substances using the table to the right. So you'd have like carbon dioxide, phosphorus, fluor, trifluoride. So dioxide, trifluoride. And then you have D-nitrogen trioxide. So that would be N2, O3. So N2, O3. And then if you went to the next one, you have carbon monoxide. That's one, so you'd have one carbon, so C, and then one oxygen, O. So you can see here, if you're gonna name ionic substances, you go a little bit different. So you name with the cation first, and then the anion second. So cations are the atoms with the positive net charge, and the anions are the atoms with the negative net charge. They ended in ide. So here, and these keep the elemental name. So here you have sodium chloride, potassium, Fluoride, so potassium keeps the element name, fluorine takes the ide. Lithium fluoride, so L I F. Lithium fluoride. Magnesium oxide, so magnesium oxide is like MgO3 or something, or O2, I don't remember off the top of my head, but again, it's the idea of putting, I think it's O2, MgO2. It's the idea that you're putting 
magnesium, and then you're going oxide, so Mg, O2, so oxide, oxygen, fluoride, fluorine, chloride, fluorine. So naming ionic substances is a really key skill. You'll get used to it. You'll sort of pick it up as you go as well. Like you, you'll do more and you'll go, oh yeah, I get what's going on now. Like you'll just, it's something that you'll get stronger at as you go throughout. So then this gets far more complicated and probably shouldn't all be a one slide, but nonetheless it is. Um, naming compounds with polyatomic poly ions. So these form compounds that have both ionic and covalent bonds. So you need to name the cation first and the anion second. Um, there's no prefixes unless the polyatomic ion has one in its name, e.g. dichromate. Um, and when it's when there is more than one polyatomic ion, it is surrounded by brackets. So what I'm trying to say here is that this is probably the best example down here, SO3. SO3 is sort of its own joint thing. I mean, call it sulfite. So you can see here, sulfite. You usually work with sulfate more than sulfite, but nonetheless, sulfite. And sulfite is like, it's a polyatomic ion. It's two atoms that form its own ion. It's just kind of its own thing. It's a bit of a rarity. Um, it's something you've got to get used to. These things are rare differences in what we work with. So as you can see here, um, the first one here actually really isn't the polyatomic, but nonetheless we'll go through it. First one here, PBI2. So you've got to think about what are our, what are our molecules there? So you've got iodine, you've got, let's jump across, let's jump across to our thing. PB. So PB is a bit of an interesting one because PB doesn't have the same name, like the same lettering as its name. So if I find PB, PB is lead. PB doesn't look anything like lead. It's not an L, it's not an LE, it's nothing like that. There are a few of them like that. Another one's like AU, which is gold, and AG, which is silver. N neither of those look anything like what they're meant to be. Like potassium wise, potassium K, if you know what I mean. There are some that will come up and you just need to be able to know them or you need to be able to go to your, your periodic table and find them. So coming back to here, so back to here, we can find that we have our PBI2. So we have lead iodide or lead diiodide, but we don't call that diiodide. We just call it lead iodide, despite the fact there's two of them because it's its own naming. Now, potassium. Now, what do we have? We have sulfite. Now, how do I have, now do I know I have sulfite? Because it is SO3. Now, yes, I have two potassiums, but we don't need to worry about that. We just call it potassium sulfite because it's the cation, like there's no prefixes because of the way that the molecules are written. You kind of, you have to write the molecule like this. You, because of the sulfite having a negative two, you have to have something with a charge of positive two at the front. Now, if it was magnesium, that would be fine. But, oh no, not magnesium, if you had the copper probably is a better example. Yeah, copper, that's fine because copper is two plus, but you have potassium, which is one plus. You need two potassiums. You don't worry about that. We just still call it potassium sulfite because you can assume from that name, you've got two potassiums. Now, carbon chloride, again, you don't worry about it too much. You just say, look, it's carbon chloride. Now, lithium carbonate, again, you find carbonate, it's CO3, two minus, lithium is going to be two plus, it's going to be two, so ally two, but you don't worry about it too much because you've got, you know carbonate is that, so you're going to work with it. Now, there are, as I said, there's no prefixes, however, there are a couple that do. Dichromate is an example of that, dichromate. Why have we got this here twice? I don't know why. Nonetheless, dichromate does come up a bit. Dichromate is a common one that... Um, is at the start, so CR at the start, and there's two of them, and we still call it dichromate, even though it should just be chromate, but it reads off the tongue well, not gonna complain, one of those ones that comes up a bit. Now, oxy anions are polyatomic anions that contain oxygen, so the suffix eight is used for oxy anions of a given element, so nitrate, sulfate, carbonate, phosphate, for anions with one less oxygen, but with the same number of anions, we change it to ite. So as you can see here, we go from nitrate to nitrite, um, as it has one less oxygen than nitrate. For anions with one more oxygen, oxygen but the same number of anions, we go from eight to per. So instead of saying chlorate, we say perchlorate. 
um, as it has one more to so go ClO4 instead of ClO3. Um, now that stuff's very advanced and it's stuff that you'll learn as you go through. Again, naming acids is another thing that again, it gets really, really complicated. I think it's probably a little bit beyond where you need to be at this point in time. Um, naming sort of acids is, is that next step on in your journey that again, if you didn't understand it right now, that is okay. Um, I'm just going to leave this slide here. We've got about 10 minutes left. So what I'm going to do is just jump into how to study. I think if you can read through this slide and understand that's great. If you don't, don't worry, you will go through this in class. I think it's a bit too much right now to sort of be adding on to what you've done. So just quickly how to study. These are from Isabel. These are not from me. I'll add my own little spice to them as I go through. But to do well in chemistry, Isabel's discussed, you know, the strong logical reasoning, the good mathematical skills and succinct clear language. And I think they're all really good things. Now, the good mathematical skills, again, if you really hate maths, probably not going to love chemistry, but it shouldn't be too bad because chemistry uses a lot of simple mathematics. It uses a lot of simple algebra. You use a small calculator. You don't use your big class pads and your big, you know, technical, scientific, really big hooby-dooby calculators. You use a little small ones. You get... Um, quite used to them as you go through. And the maths is pretty straightforward, although there is a fair bit of it. So do be prepared. If you don't like maths, you might struggle a little bit with chemistry. So having good math skills is an important skill. You don't need to be a wizard. You don't need to be doing, you know, really advanced mathematics. Um, strong logical reasoning is a really important skill, and especially problem solving. Chemistry is a lot of problem solving. It's not like your, um, it's not like your psychology. It's not like your, I don't know what other subjects I'm trying to think of, but probably more like your humanity subjects, whereas a lot of just rope learning, there's a lot of like, all right, I need to know this definition. I need to know exactly how to rewrite that down into a page and exam. That doesn't happen like that in chemistry. There's a lot of problem solving. There's a lot of working your way through a situation. Focus on strengthening your weaknesses. I really like that one. Um, you should always focus on strengthening your weaknesses. It's something that's a skill you should be doing, especially now in year 11, heading into year 12. Always focus on strengthening your weaknesses. Um, make and update your notes consistently. Have some really good notes and summaries from this year so that you can look back on them in year 12. Um, always practice questions. Practice questions are great. I think that's a really good tip. Ensure you can respond to questions with concise wording and logical flow. Logical flow is a really important thing. It's been just been added to the BCE study designs. I'm sure it's probably somewhere in the HSC points. If not, it's already there. This whole idea of flow, they like things to flow. When you answer a question, they don't necessarily love dot point yes there are times where dot point is acceptable but there's a lot of times where they like yeah don't give it to me dot point i don't want it dot point fair enough logical flow means it should flow from a to b it should flow down as you go through now build up on thorough understanding build up build up on thoroughly understanding your content rather than plain memorizing exactly what i was just trying to say chemistry is about problem solving it's not about just straight up going into it and going, all right, I'm going to remember this definition and that. No, it's not, it's not, it's not. And please don't go into it expecting it to be that. That is not what chemistry is. Chemistry is all about problem solving and working through different situations and applying different chemical elements. Now, what's really important as well throughout chemistry, the different modules that overlap, they do not, and they are not singular different subjects. It's not like, you know, you're doing history and you're doing one era and then you're going to another era and you're going to another era. These things overlap, really important. One, one module will overlap into another module. Questions will overlap between the two. So keeping on top of the content you've already been through is important. When you get back test results, looking at the results you got and figuring out where you didn't go as well is really important. So then you are stronger at it the next time you touch it. Stuff like that. Um, I think they're just, just the general skills for chemistry and I, I think they are what you should be working on throughout as well as just learning how to study at this level throughout year 11 so that when you hit year 12, you'll be smashing it. Outside of that, I think that's about everything for today. Um, I thank you all for coming. Again, this recording will be up afterwards for a little while um, and then it goes to ATAR Notes Plus. The chat will still be there, but it won't be functioning. So if you have any questions, look in the chat and see if the questions are there. If they're not there, then maybe you'll have to search up or ask either like a tutor or an exam or uh, a tutor or a teacher or someone else the questions but make sure you get them answered don't just leave questions unanswered if you don't know what's going on otherwise um good luck hopefully isabel will be in the chat if not it'll be me um and thanks for coming